Pop Pod. Welcome to Pop Gold Pod, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in Ireland known as the Pop Gold Compound. I'm your cult leader, Tom Pot, and I guess this is a late edition. <laughs> so, just a bit of clarification, and I guess apologise very quickly. I've had a busy couple of weeks, last two weeks I've been working non-stop. And I had a few other things as well I had to, to deal with, in, including being a little bit sick. So, just happened that the features I was working on the last two weeks were a bit lengthy, so apologies that this is late. I'll, I'll try to be a bit more punctual. The next week will definitely be on time. So apologies if you're waiting. I don't think anyone waits for this feverishly. Like, but, <laughs> but anyway, here we go. Let me make it up to you with some cool eight. Top eight news stories from across the medium. Starting first. Awful idea for <laughs> a movie in my opinion. And that is Mattel and MGM have announced a Viewmaster film. Now, a lot of people might be saying, what is a Viewmaster? A Viewmaster is, it's kind of like binoculars. You probably remember them. And you put them up to your, your face and there's a little clicker and it cycles through a load of photos and it would be like oh look at all the sites of europe look at your fo- family photos i don't know <laughs> i don't know i haven't seen a viewmaster in years which is i guess now why they want to bring it back for a movie i don't know so here's a statement since the 1940s viewmaster has inspired wonder and joy in children of all ages creating huge opportunities for storytelling <laughs> i hadn't read the statement i just copied and pasted it but wow Huge opportunities for storytelling, if you say so. Head of Mattel, Robbie Brenner. Head of Mattel's film division, and they haven't put out a film yet, but you burn that place, Robbie Brenner. They're very busy, actually. We're going to get to that in a sec. MGM Pictures has tremendous expertise and a proven track record in capturing audiences' imagination through film. And we're proud to be partnering with them to bring another Mattel franchise to theatres. This marks another important milestone as we transform Mattel into an IP-driven, high-performing toy company. Luck. Yuck. All right. <laughs> This is a weird property to adapt. Of all the toys in the world, of all the toys they no doubt own, they're going to pick this old, antiquated toy that doesn't really have much story retelling potential. I, I, I have a few ideas written down for what they could do with it. I don't know, this seems really, really dumb. I tried looking up, like, Viewmaster on Wikipedia. I was like, let's see what Viewmaster is, what's what's going on with it lately. Uh, see if maybe there's some huge gap I'm missing here. Now it's more or less sounds like they kind of move towards VR. So, is that really? You're going to try to bring that into a movie, I guess, maybe? Probably not, though. It's just, it seems like a a movie that isn't sold on its brand. And when you're adapting a toy, that's pretty much exactly what you need, because I don't think people have any love or affection for, like, Viewmaster. We'll see. Anyway, here's what I'm thinking, okay? As far as storytelling potential with this. Because of the varied selection of pictures, they could maybe represent different settings, timelines transport characters into the frame of the viewfinder a la a Jumanji or a Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle or a Jumanji 3 whatever that ends up being titled Welcome Back to the Jungle or Welcome to the Real World <laughs> whatever they call it it could be a mystery story or maybe an adventure maybe like the viewfinder is like central to the plot I don't know that's that's spitballing here I fully expect one of these ideas to be stolen because <laughs> I'm sure they're listening I don't know I could just be hoping for the best it seems like unlikely I could just be something crappy animated thing <laughs> you know this is just they are talking about being an IP driven high performing thing and we talked about how they only have one film or well how haven't, they haven't put out a film yet I should say and right now MGM and Mattel are working on two films together this Viewmaster movie and American Girl Dolls which I looked them up one I could tell they're just just toy dolls really for of little babies or something overall they've got four movies in development as a whole Including Hot Wheels and Barbie. Hot Wheels we talked about on the show already. Barbie we briefly discussed. That's the one with Margot Robbie attached. Which, You know what? Don't even make the movie. The casting is perfect. Good job. (laughs) That's all we need. That's it. We're done. Wrap it. They have a slate of 22 shows in the works. Across different platforms as well. So. I don't know. Is Mattel kind of going crazy here? I don't know how people how interested people are in kind of toys anymore, and I don't think I'm trying to think of any big toy brand that's going to get people in a, into a cinema. But I don't know. I don't. Maybe I just don't know what kids like these days. <laughs> I just thought it was video games. Well, speaking of what kids like, or what people are hoping kids are like, we have the Scooby Doo animated film. The cast of this has been revealed. Let's talk a little bit about it. We got a brief bit of the story as well, which we're also going to discuss. So here is who has joined the cast as of this week. Will Forte, Gina Rodriguez, and Frank Welker. They've been cast as members of Mystery Inc., so that's the, the Scooby gang, 
Well, that's Scooby Gang is Buffy, but you know, you know what I mean. Forte is going to be playing Shaggy. Rodriguez is going to be playing Velma, and Frank Welker. They didn't say who was playing, but presumably he's going to be Fred and Scooby because he's voiced those characters in the past for quite a long time. There was another name they also announced is being joined in the cast, and that was Tracy Morgan, and he's playing Captain Caveman. So, what does that mean? <laughs> This is going to be a huge, big Hanna-Barbera crossover film, from the sounds of it. The plot synopsis that... Well, it's, I don't think it's an official plot synopsis, but the report has stated that the Mystery Inc. gang joined forces with other heroes at a Hanna-Barbera universe to save the world from Dick Dastardly and his evil plans. Well, okay. Let's just break that down a little bit, because I don't know how to feel about that. Like, that's a lot to do. And you really should just focus on making a good Scooby-Doo movie first. Because there hasn't been a film in a long time. And I don't think there's ever been an animated film in theaters. Certainly nothing on this scale. So why not just do a Scooby film. And then do the other Hannah Barbera films. Or cross them over after. So what could that mean? Who might we see? Poss- like Here's a list of Hannah Barbera properties. I think they're all by different studios. So there's a good chance we won't get these. We have the Jetsons. The Flintstones. Yogi Bear. I think Hong Kong Fooey. Actually let's talk about this. Because <laughs> the most fun I had with this story. I, I spent about 40 minutes l- looking into this. Ta- looking up Dick Dastardly. So I had to I cleared my, my search history after an hour, just in case. And first of all, Dick Dastardly is a pretty lame villain. He nearly always fails. He's not really in- imposing or threatening. But one of the things I loved was that... <laughs> for this, I was looking at Dick Dastardly's Wikipedia page. And somebody is a real Dick Dastardly fan out there. Someone is... A student of Dick Dastardly. Like, it's amazingly detailed. So, first of all, we start with a conspiracy theory. Okay? This is to do with Dick Dastardly. <laughs> this, this is like, the, fa- this is like the, be- the highlight of my week so far. Reading about Dick Dastardly on Wikipedia. <laughs> this is exactly this is exactly how it was written. Copied and pasted at the time. I'm not sure. I haven't checked if it's still up or maybe if it was just a quick edit. So, it says, On one occasion, Dastardly did cross the finish line in first place but was revealed to have extended the nose of his car at the last moment and was disqualified in favour of Penelope Pitstop. This, despite the fact that other characters have pulled similar stunts in the past without punishment. And indeed, the original footage showed that Dazzley had not extended the nose of his car. Jesus Christ! Wake up, America! <laughs> like, I love that someone got that annoyed, did that amount of research, and they were like, just fighting for Dick Dastardly. They're like, he was screwed out of this here. And it, I, I see what's happening. I see the world for what it is. Dick Dastardly won that race, man. <laughs> the world's leading most Dick Dastardly expert. I like to <laughs> I like to think he goes around handing out business cards with them. You know, the number one Dick Dastardly expert in the world. How are you doing tonight? May I be of service? He wrote himself a book. You don't know Dick. <laughs> That's his autobiography. The author of You Don't Know Dick, Tales of Disc Dastardly. Then another thing I find out, actually, look it up. We're not done with Dick Dastardly. Forget about the Scooby-Doo cast, and that's, <laughs> that is what it is. We're now t- this is now a Dick Dastardly podcast. This is the Dick Dastardly hour. <laughs> Here's the next part, it says, and I love how this analysis goes on. And it's, it's a little bit sad, actually, because there's a, a grain of truth here. And this person's clearly done the research, and he says, It seemed likely that if Dastardly had not bothered to cheat, he might have won many of the races fairly. The mean machine was the fastest car on the grid, and Dastardly's driving ability was often shown to be superior to the other racers. Alas, Dick seemed bound to a code similar to that of wrestler Gorgeous George. Win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. <laughs> oh, you gotta applaud the person who put that time and effort in. That poor man. That number one Dick Dastardly expert man. We gotta have him on the podcast somehow. I don't know what that we'll ask him about. Um, just let's just have him. Maybe he's, he's got an interesting insights in a lot of characters. Maybe he's figured out how Freddy found Wilma. How they matched together. How they fell in love. Maybe he knows Daffy Duck's dark, dark secret. I'll play some ominous music there. <laughs> Another thing I found out from scrolling Dick Dastardly's Wikipedia page. Just, this podcast has no structure anymore, does it? This isn't the new story we started it off with. Is that there's three Dick Dastardlies. Uh, okay, so you have Dick Dastardly. The one from the Flying Machines one, which is... Catch the pigeon, whatever that's called. It's like Mean Machine or something. Um, no, it's not called that. It's like Flying Machine or something. But everyone calls it Catch the Pigeon because the theme song is just Catch the Pigeon and that's what the show is about. And do you need anything else to tell you what show I'm talking about? It's 
call catch the pigeon. They try to catch a pigeon, and the theme song is catch the pigeon, catch the pigeon. So that was one dick dastardly because that took place in World War One because it was a messenger pigeon, which. By the way, apparently it turns out he was working for the Axis, so he's definitely a bad guy in that, in that incarnation. Then there was Wacky Races, which was a different Dick Dastardly. That was the son of the Dick Dastardly from Catch the Pigeon. And then they rebooted Wacky Races, which I didn't know about. But I didn't know a lot about Dick Dastardly, apparently. I didn't know Dick. <laughs> the number one best-selling book from the foremost expert on Dick Dastardly, I'll remind you. The reboot of Wacky Races had... The son of Dick Dazzley in the original Rocky Rate Races. So the grandson of the Dick Dazzley in Catch the Pigeon. So there's three Dick Dazzleys. So we're on to Dick Dazzley the third. And they all seem to be the exact same. And look the exact same. But hey, aren't you glad you're joining this podcast today now? You've finally gotten some insight on Dick Dazzley. Wow. Okay. Oh, right. I should probably talk about scooby Doo's, And that's what we're talking about. The one person who's really not happy about this actually is Matthew Lillard. Who was... Shaggy in the live action Scooby Doo movies in the 2000s. He, like, whatever else you want to say about that movie, the casting in general for that was fantastic. But Matthew Lillard was Shaggy. He was perfect. He looked it, he sounded it, he acted it. Fantastic. He went to Twitter and basically said, So, this is how I find out. No one told me. Thanks, basically. So, no one informed him that he was being replaced. He's been the voice of Shaggy for a long time now. Not just in those movies, he's gone on to be a voice actor for the character. And they just replaced him. Which seems to be going around lately. Here's here's an issue I have with that, right? Is there really need for a celebrity stunt casting in the Scooby Doo movie? Like Scooby Doo brand should sell it, right? It's not like people are going and especially the names they have. No disrespect to Gina Rodriguez or Will Forte, I like both of them. They're not names that are gonna if people go, oh Scooby Doo movie. You know, it's not like they got a list actors for it. It's just a very it's a bit of a shame. I don't know. This is a very odd movie overall. I don't really understand why they're doing a big Hanna Barbera crossover. I mean, like maybe they saw Spider-Verse and they figured it would work that way. Maybe they figured we can introduce all these at once and then spin them off. I don't know. I'm, I have a passing interest in this because of how weird it is. And if it means we get more Dick Dastardly, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm all about the dick. Oh, God, that's going to come back and bite me, isn't it? I shouldn't have said that. How can I transition? Scooby-Doo animated for them. Ba -ba -ba. <laughs> Puppy power. Uh... <laughs> Let's talk about other films that have been dated in a new segment I'm starting because we had a lot of dates this week. A lot of talk about shuffling dates. So in our new segment, I need a date. Somebody please date me. God, I'm so lonely. <laughs> oh, that's a sad title. A lot of films got shuffled around this week. We were talking about kids' movies, so we'll start with those. That's, that was my transition. See, that was not a lazy transition. I transitioned from an animated Scooby-Doo film to an animated Clifford the Big Red Dog movie, which is what we're talking about. I have a few sources on this. They've told me Clifford the Big Red Dog is about a cat named Theo. Uh, small and yellow. Pretty sure that source is accurate. Take it with a pinch of salt, I suppose, if it doesn't turn out to be true. Given the date of November 13, 2020, it's Clifford the Big Red Dog. It's all in the name. People, if, <laughs> if you like Clifford the Big Red Dog, I guess you're very happy. Then we have a film that I didn't know about, or I'd forgotten about, that got bumped from its schedule. It was originally at that date, also from Paramount Pictures. It's a live-action CGI hybrid movie of The Rugrats. Hmm. I don't know why that's live action. Why not just make it all CGI? I, like, is it just the backgrounds are going to be live action or CGI? Because like, the babies have to be CGI. So why are they, they just going to have real backgrounds? Like, why? I don't know. Anyway, that's happening. We have no other details at all about that. It's coming out January 29, 2021. And another, well, a bit darker kid property that they completely removed off their schedule was Are You Afraid of the Dark? Which is meant to come out October 4th of this year. I don't think it's even started filming, so it's not a total surprise. But this has just been pulled from its schedule and not redated. Who knows? It's gone for now. Maybe it'll be back. Then again, we also got other dates shifted around. Not just kids' movies, of course. The Kitchen, which is based on a DC Vertigo comic series. It follows three wives of Irish mobsters in 70s Hell's Kitchen. Uh, once their husbands are sent to prison, they step up and take the place. And they're apparently quite good at it. The three leads for that film are Melissa McCarthy, Tiffany Haddish and Elizabeth Moss. Included in the cast are Donald Fleeson and Common. Andrea Burloff, who co-wrote Straight Outta Compton, is going to make her directorial debut with this. This movie is now coming out August 9th, so it actually got moved up from September 20th. So August 9th, that's coming at you. I imagine we'll get a, a trailer in the next month or two, so if that's the case. Not, not a bad premise. I can see this working, actually. And uh, if it's going to be a bit darker and a bit humorous, nothing wrong with that. Speaking of a kind of darker comic book property, Kingsman, The Great Game, got bumped to 2020. It's not coming out at the end of this year anymore. It'll be out next year. We don't need to talk about that. We'll probably talk about Kingsman pretty soon. 
Because we seem to be talking about a lot of the same properties over and over again. And we got a property I haven't spoken about yet. I don't think a property anyone has spoken about in quite a while. Rambo. There is another Rambo coming out. The final Rambo. But they've said that before. Rambo Last Blood is coming out September 20th of this year. So not far away for that. Stallone is 71 years old. It's weird seeing, considering we just saw Kree 2 and they played up as like, oh, this old guy. And now we're probably going to be like, oh, look at this Jack Rambo, bro. He's like totally killing all these illegals or whatever's going to happen in that movie. Because that's, uh, I mean, it's re it's. I feel like we're enabling Stallone at this point, aren't we? That we all buy him as this big buff action guy still. I mean, look, he needs a job, I guess. Let him let him work away, but I don't know. This is gonna have to look really good to convince me to see it. I feel the same with Schwarzenegger. It's like, yeah, good on you, Arnold. You you keep doing what you're doing, but I'm not gonna go see it. <laughs> oh, I feel bad for. Her. Do you know what you, do? You know what you do? Oh well, I was gonna say what you do is you take all those washed up action guys and stick them in a movie where they have to fight and and they're all together. I suppose that was the Expendables movies, really, wasn't it? I guess we're not getting any more of those after the last one wasn't wasn't the, the big hit that they were hoping for, but it leaked online and it was PG-13, so what do you expect? Well, speaking of sequels that we never thought we'd get, we got word of Edge of Tomorrow or Live, Die, Repeat or All You Need Is Kill because the name of that movie was shifted and changed and really awkward. They really... Let me get into that because people probably have no idea what I'm talking about. So it came out as, all you need is kill is the original name of the property. That was what the film was going to be called at one point. Then they changed it to Edge of Tomorrow, which was pretty bland, boring enough title. They kind of pushed Live, Die, Repeat into the marketing a lot. And then when it came out in DVD, it seemed like they were trying to retroactively name the movie that. Maybe they were hoping that people would like pick it up being like, oh, I haven't heard of this movie. Not realizing it was Edge of Tomorrow or whatever. It turns out that this movie is actually gearing up towards a sequel, from the sound of it. Now, we've heard this before. This film came out in 2014, I believe. We've heard about the talk of a sequel for a while. Matthew Robinson, the writer of The Invention of Lying and Monster Trucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> those are good properties that you want for making a sci-fi Tom Cruise movie. The Invention of Lying, a Ricky Gervais comedy, and Monster Trucks. That very literal kids movie that was a huge bomb. He's working on a sequel to Warner Bros. He successfully pitched them an idea and it sounds like Doug Lehman who directed the first one and Warner Bros are very happy with it aside from that they want Doug Lehman back as director they of course want Emily Blunt and Tom Cruise back it seems like Blunt and Cruise oh Blunt and Cruise <laughs> that sounds badass put them in a fucking body cop movie man. Blunt and Cruise on the case he's the wheel man with a heart of gold throwing some shaft music Blunt is a bad cop, but there ain't no good cop to stop her. Blunt and Cruise this summer. You know what? <laughs> Just do hey, make that movie instead of Edge of Tomorrow. That'll make more money. Emily Blunt to Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is the wheelman, and Emily Blunt, I guess, is the legs. <laughs> that sounds sexist. That's not how he meant it. How dare you? Anyway, no deals have been made on this. We're kind of waiting to see how. They react to the script from the sound of it. If they're happy with the script, this will probably go. Lehman is going to help work on it with the writer. They tried making this a lot, as I said. But War Warner Bros. are quite happy with it. And I think they really want their franchise. I don't think this is going to be it, because the first one was a bit of an underperformance, unfortunately. Because it was a very good movie, and it was different. I don't know what you really do with that for a sequel. Like, you had a time loop from the first one. Are we just going to get into a time loop? or like What, what do you put in that to make it... To make it work. But then again. This, maybe this is why they've struggled to make it so far. Alright. Another film they've struggled to make. New Mutants. More like No Mutants. Am I right? <laughs> Just to be clear. What happened there. Was I, I high fived myself. Which I realise is just a clap. And it probably blew your eardrums out. So apologies for that. We got a little bit more information about New Mutants. Or more specifically what. What is going on with it? What's wrong with it? We had confirmation. I'd said this back in my very first episode that I'd heard this film was reshooting, but I'd also heard that it hadn't started as reshoots. So we got confirmation of that this week. They were scheduled. The reshoots have been scheduled. They've yet to take place. And it sounds like that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future. The actual report said that even though they're expected to take place, there's nothing planned regarding them. Which makes it sound like they're not going to do them. 
especially before this Disney merger. And to a certain point, why should they? Why why would you just start these massive expensive reshoots and then be like, hey, we we don't really want this movie. <laughs> like, here, which is bringing us to our next point about it. It sounds like, and this is what the writer said of this, of this piece, which was at the Heat Vision blog at Hollywood Reporter. They said they're going to try, they believe it's not going to get a theatrical release. It's unlikely. And they think it's going to get a release on Disney+, Plus, which is Disney streaming service. Now, I think it's a lot more likely this is going to go on Hulu. Because more and more we're seeing that Disney are using Hulu for darker, less family-friendly properties. And in fact, this week there was maybe even something to strengthen that rumour. Was that Disney are looking to buy AT&T's share of Hulu, which is at 10%. And that would give them 70% stake in Hulu. With the last 30% being NBC Universal. So it does seem like Hulu is definitely going to be a plan for like new acquisitions or some of the darker properties they own. Or the more obscure stuff. Yeah, New Mutants. I, this definitely isn't coming out in theatres. I, I think the big question, they're going to look at it when they, get, when they acquire it. When this deal goes through. I don't think they're going to spend much more money on it. If they can get a working cut of it, I think they'll just put it online. I don't think they're made. It doesn't make any sense to spend this movie. Like, it, assuming they are going to bring the X-Men back. And they are. They've already got Dark Phoenix coming out. Which, uh, we have a trailer for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. It does seem that's going to come out. Because they spent so much money on it already. But something with New Mutants, it's kind of smaller. And there's no sense throwing good money after bad money, you know. It doesn't... It, it, it's cheaper. People don't really care about it. It's already meant to come out a long time ago. I think they'll just put bury it on Hulu. And hope it just drives people towards a platform that they now have quite a, a sizable stake in. Uh, the, the real question with that, with Hulu and this whole thing, Hulu is only in Canada and America, and Netflix everywhere has certain rights that are just to stuff that is on Hulu. So what this means as soon as Disney Plus launches, is Disney Plus going to have Hulu content on it as well over in Europe? Is Hulu going to launch over here? Is Disney Plus going to be competing with themselves? would be very odd to launch two streaming services in Europe, but we shall see. Those are a lot of the questions that we have. Speaking of another comic book update, I'll talk about DC stuff. And one is Aquaman 2. We knew this was coming. It's coming out December 16th, 2022. Now, let's talk a bit about that date, because a lot of people are maybe concerned. Concerned could be the wrong word. Somewhat angry. That Yeah, well, actually, you know what? Angry is probably the wrong word. I guess they are confused, which is that four years is a big gap to take there. Four years for a film that cleared a billion. That is a sizable gap. Now, I don't know if that's just playing it safe. Maybe this film could be moved forward. I don't know. As far as DC's slate in general, it is pretty full. I think the only thing that doesn't have a firm date that looks like it was going to come out in 2021, the year before Aquaman 2 drops its flash, maybe it could move up to there. Because The Flash certainly isn't going anywhere. It's actually that this week we had news that The Flash is going to be rewritten again by the directors, uh, John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein. So it doesn't sound like Flash is going anywhere quickly. You know what pun unintended? That wasn't that wasn't good enough to be for me to claim it was a good pun. <laughs> we don't know if James Wan is going to come back to direct Aquaman too. In fact, I would be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't. It's it sounds like he's one of these guys who who likes moving on. It. He put a lot of work and a lot of time into Aquaman, so I don't know if he's going to jump back into that four years is a long time to dedicate yourself to a project and he might just produce it or have some input on the script david leslie johnson mcgoldrick which uh, which is not a law firm which is one guy with four names david leslie johnson mcgoldrick attorney at law <laughs> okay he's writing the script first thing you need to write is a, a fucking change of name form Get a legal document and change your name. David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick. Shorten it. But just David McG. <laughs> D.L. Johnson. There you go. David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick. Ridiculous. Just cut it out. <laughs> anyway. So Aquaman 2 is getting a sequel. Flash doesn't seem to be going anywhere. What's odd? And I wonder if this is the reason that Flash is delayed. Ezra Miller kind of mentioned the possibility that this is going to open up the possibility of multiverses. And that really does sound like Flashpoint. Now, Flashpoint was what people were pushing for a long time when DC was kind of messed up. When it looked like the universe was falling apart. And they were like, you can use Flashpoint to, to reboot this or bring this actor in. or uh. And now that DC are doing alright for themselves, maybe that plan has changed. 
I don't know. Maybe that is what the, the hold up is. Either way, Flash seems to be in trouble. It's gone through multiple directors, multiple writers. It doesn't seem to be any closer to happening, so who knows? If they wanted to bring in the, the new Batman into, well, not main continuity, but modern time, I guess, because we don't really know when this younger Batman is going to be set, or if it's just going to ignore the the Affleck continuity or if they're going to recast Superman possibly I don't think they're going to recast Superman just yet even if Cavill is out I don't think they're recasting Superman this quickly we ha did have confirmation from Kevin Sujihara Warner Bros. Chief Executive that it's going to be a less connected universe going forward which is something we speculated on it more or less laid that out last week it seemed really likely that that was the case because of their, the way their slate was going we got confirmation from Justin Kroll at Variety that Will Smith is not going to be returning for the Suicide Squad sequel. I guess I can just call it the Suicide Squad because that's a Bernie our title, that ugly, ugly title. And that awful habit of just putting the in front of everything. Just, yeah, whoa. Look, I, I just think about this now for a sec, actually. We're talking about the four year gap, right? I think, is there only four years between Suicide Squad and this rebooted Suicide Squad? I don't know. I, I, mm, maybe. Or is it 2021? For, yeah, it's 2021, I think, for Suicide Squad. Never mind, five years. But uh, well, are there enough of them that have four year gaps? Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises was four years. I don't think any of the Marvel properties have had that big a gap. Well, the Guardians 2 and Guardians 3 are going to have a huge gap now. Yeah, I don't think there's any. For, it's very rare for a four year film gap. So it is quite long. I don't think it's a ma major thing. Maybe they'll have the trench movie in the middle, like, as much as people are probably indifferent to that. Yeah, it's, it, I think that's just. They're, not, they're, they're showing people they're not going to rush it. If they have it ready in time, I think we'll get one before that. Maybe four years is a bit long. Who knows? Entertainment moves pretty quickly. But I, as long as there's comic book movies, as long as they're popular, four years isn't going to be that big a deal. Especially with a billion dollar movie, I, I wouldn't think. People seem to love it. Well, more details on Will Smith. Uh, is apparently just scheduling was the main issue there. It was amicable the studio does want Margot Robbie back. There was rumours she wasn't going to come back, but it seems like right as of now, at least, she's on board. There's a rumour going around Viola Davis is going to come back. That's not been confirmed anywhere. But they're hoping to get this as pre-production by autumn. So we will see how that plays out and we'll have a few updates here, I'm sure. <laughs> you know something I remember during the week? And I think it's kind of funny looking back. Like This Suicide Squad movie, the original, the David Ayer one. One that everyone hated, well most people hated. And got shat on and torn apart. It's really funny to think that some members of the cast got a tattoo. That said squad to be like, yeah, we're going to be together forever, right guys? And now half of them are just like ditched. <laughs> like the only other movie I can think of doing that, they did that as like uh, Lord of the Rings movies. But they had a hugely successful trilogy and they had like one shitty film that now it seems to be being rebooted. <laughs> they definitely regret that. Well, we talk about who's in and out of casting. Let's talk a bit more about casting in a returning segment, Cast Podcast, where we talk look at the week's casting news. This confirmed casting first. Jordan Peele's Candyman reboot, which he is co-writing and producing, which is going to be directed by Nia DaCosta. We have our Candyman, ladies and gentlemen, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, best known as Black Manta in Aquaman. He is now Candyman, going forward. I've heard, the I think the original actor who played Candyman is not actually, in a refreshing change of pace, <laughs> from some of the, the latest reactions, he basically said, you know, I think he's going to do his own thing, and good luck to him, and He's happy to see this, but if Jordan P wants to reach out to him, he's he's happy to take a part in the two. It sounds like he's being a bit more in line with his expectations of what you would expect for a, a reboot of this movie. I've also heard it's more it's going to pay homage to sequel. I think it, I think it's one of those like soft reboots where it might take place in the same it takes place in the same continuity. It's a spiritual successor. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Stalling for time there. <laughs> Uh, also with talks there at the moment hasn't been confirmed is Teona Paris who was in Mad Men and if BS Rica talked but she's going to be the female lead and a love interest so we'll see how that goes the film is coming out on June 12th 2020 other confirmed casting Sopranos prequel movie we haven't talked about that in a while talked about it for about three weeks straight first starting off but we're back to it now and that is that Ray Liotta has joined the cast which is pretty damn cool when you think about it no details have been revealed about who he's playing or anything. The report that mentioned this said that a lot of Sopranos characters are going up here. Which doesn't really help us here. I don't think it's likely he's playing an established Sopranos character. But it is nice because Sopranos has such a history of casting actors from Goodfellas. And they've got Henry Hill from Goodfellas now. Which is nice to see. Kind of comes full circle a bit. Then we have In Talks. And in a segment we started once one week, which was Lee Winnell News. <laughs> Lee Winnell is the Invisible Man. 
apparently has Elizabeth Moss and talks to Slayer. They've also very clearly stated that Johnny Depp is not coming back. Because they re put out that so... Oh, they really must regret that. <laughs> this Dark Universe photo shoot where it was all these actors that are going to be like, yeah, this is our Dark Universe. Get excited, people. And they made The Mummy and it sucked and everyone was like, oh. And now that photo was the only thing. <laughs> the only evidence that they wanted that to be a thing. Johnny Depp sued Amber Heard as well this week for 50 million. Dude, his... Dude is really messed up, man. I don't know. It's, I was going to say it's hard to like him, but I, it's, I don't think I've liked him for a long, long time. <laughs> so, either way. Then we have Ghostbusters 3, rumoured casting. Seems pretty legit. In fact, this is probably the casting you probably could have called it. I, well, not a year ago. When was that movie? It was? A month ago? Oh, was I confusing with Ghostbusters 2016, which I'm not going to talk about that till last week. That was a mess. <laughs> Finn Wolfhard which has the amazingly named Finn Wolfhard, I should say, from Stranger Things and It, is in talks to take on the teenage lead of Ghostbusters 3. How very predictable, considering everyone was like, oh, this this new Ghostbusters looks very Stranger Thingsy, And now they're like, let's get the kid from Stranger Things. They were apparently reluctant to cast him, actually, because everyone's made that same connection. But they said they loved his audition so much that they're thinking of bringing him in. Carrie Coon is going to play the role that one owner writer plays in Stranger Things as the single mother to one. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Carrie Coon is a great actress. She's playing a single mother. And I know before, I, I know an owner writer isn't Finn Wolfhard's mother in the show. That was a joke. Yeah, that is, that is what it is. It's, I don't know. It's, I, I need something a bit more substantial, I think, on Ghostbusters 3 to find out whether I'm going to like this movie yet because I started off so excited and now everything I hear, I'm like, oh, 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 you're, oh okay. Mm. All right. Another news that made me go, hmm, hmm, all right. <laughs> Wait, I can make a better connection than that. Well, speaking of a show on Netflix, let's talk about Steven Spielberg versus Netflix. That, was, that wasn't bad. That was way worse. <laughs> that was way way too heavy on it. And I, I stalled the show for that. Wow. I was going to say, why'd you come back for this? But you're, no one's listening to this. News came out this week. Steven Spielberg is planning to discuss the rate and raise concerns over... Netflix being eligible for awards. A statement he put out through his Amblin Entertainment said that Stephen feels strongly about the difference between the streaming and theatrical situation. He'll be happy if the others will join his campaign. When that comes up at the Academy Board of Governors meeting, he will see what happens. He's the head of the director branch there. The Academy has also stated that they will consider the rules at the April meeting. It's not the first time he's gone after Netflix either kind of pointed at them as like oh well if you make a film for netflix it's not a film it's a tv movie kind of thing you know oh if it's good you can win an emmy kind of thing and thompson over at indywire wrote a really good piece in this she highlighted the main complaint so here's a summation of those netflix spent too much money one oscar strategist estimated that roma had an oscar campaign of 50 million a lot of people were saying at the time it was the most expensive oscar campaign ever green book a 5 million spend on their best picture campaign the New York Times reported 25 million Netflix insisted awards were folding their entire marketing budget, so could be less than the 50 million reported. Then here's another point. The massive Roma push crushed foreign language distributor Sony Pictures Classics co-president Michael Barker said he had no financial option but to release Oscar nominees Never Look Away and Capernaum when theatres opened after the holidays, which meant fewer Academy voters had a chance to see them. Another point. Roma only spent three weeks at it as a theatrical exclusive. Netflix doesn't report box office. Netflix doesn't respect the 90 day theatrical window. And Netflix movies are available in 190 countries 24 7. This is a complex issue, and I think I actually might do a feature on it eventually because it's something that I find interesting. And there's a lot of sides to this. It's not just as simple as Spielberg is right or Spielberg is wrong. Everyone's kind of coming out against Spielberg. And there's definitely a lot of reason you should. But there is some things that are, you know, there's kind of two sides to this, definitely, at least two sides. So there's some reasonable points. It shows that Netflix just really aren't playing the same game as other studios. They're not really playing fairly. There's a kind of a sense from the members of the Academy that if Netflix wants to be in the running, they need to play ball. But the question remains whether they should or even need to. Like, let's make something clear. As much as they, those factors that I listed a minute ago pissed people off, they followed the rules to be in contention for Best Picture. Should we really be mad at Netflix for bending those rules a bit? exploiting loopholes possibly but it stands to the point in general 
that the rules need to be changed and i'm not saying that they need to be changed to knock netflix out or a streaming in fact as time goes on we're going to have even more streaming services with exclusive films on them that probably shouldn't be ruled out if the oscars really are meant to measure what the best film is you should take a lot of stuff into consideration now these rules are old they need to be updated they didn't take into consideration streaming services because there's no way they could have they were written so long ago and they did meet the requirements for oscar consideration and like a lot of films you know there's been cases where films have only been in theaters for a week to get their eligibility for oscar season and then released after nominations and that was before netflix was a thing and a lot of these rules obviously couldn't have predicted how things were going to go and as I said, like you look at the amount of directors who are now working on streaming, Ava DuVernay, the Coen brothers, Steven Soderbergh, and obviously Martin Scorsese is the big one. Like He's got a film coming out this year, and they haven't fully revealed what their release strategy is going to be, that it is going to get a theatrical release, but we don't know what's beyond that. And if this means blocking Martin Scorsese out of the Oscars, that's wrong, in my opinion. He's a seasoned filmmaker. He makes great films. I don't think another studio would have bankrolled something this expensive because it's more worth it for Netflix because if this does go, let's say, I think the budget for the Irishman that they're saying is about 200 million. A 200 million R rated film. Now, if you put that into traditional theaters, hey, it might do well. It could do well, but it's risky and you have to hope people are going to come out during award season, during Christmas when all these blockbusters and big things are on. And pay money to see your movie. That's expensive. And that has a limited audience. Or you can stick it on Netflix. Who are in 190 countries. And people are going to throw it on because they're at home. And it's easy to put on. I'm not saying there's not an audience for that. I'm just saying that. You've got to remember that Netflix is offering a platform. And other streaming services will eventually. When they get as big. Or whether they get as big as questionable. But when they get they establish their platform. There's going to be directors who's able to put more creative risk and have a bit more of a budget for Netflix. And it, more importantly, I think, is that streaming is the future of movies in a different way in that it's been a massive hub for independent filmmakers. Like independent cinema is starting to thrive on video on demand and streaming. And if you take their eligibility out of it, you're really crushing the next generation of filmmakers. And it would really go a long way in making the Oscars relevant, even more so. So, I don't know, we have to see how it plays out. As I said, that's just a brief thought I've had. Those are just a few thoughts I've had. I think I will probably talk about this in the future. What, what, where the Oscars should draw the line, maybe, where the line is between TV and film, because that line blurs as well. Anyway, let's get on to our quick hits. Ta little, little news stories that we pick up, we rip, and then we hit them. Out of the park, baby. Walking Dead is getting another spin-off. AMC have confirmed that a second Walking Dead spin-off is in the works. The first, of course, was Fear the Walking Dead. This was announced on an earnings call to Wall Street analysts. They revealed little else except that it is an active development. Last week, we laughed at their declining ratings, which were addressed by COO Ed Carroll, stating that you would expect this from a show that's been airing for nine years. So, we're not going to laugh at The Walking Dead this week. Instead, we'll just laugh at AMC for being so creatively bankrupt that they now have three shows about zombies. <laughs> MC uh. Rami Malek is apparently in final talks to take on the role of a villain in Bond 25 Biddy Magnuson is also expected to take on the role of a CIA agent Malek won't be the first Oscar winner to take on Bond the villains of the last two Bond movies were actually played by Oscar winners Craig has had a great rogues gallery including Christoph Waltz and Spectre Javier Bardem and Skyfall Mads Mikkelsen in Casino Royale and then um Oh, uh, that guy in um, in Quantum of Solace. Uh, he was uh, he was the guy. He had like uh, the dark hair. Um, oh God, was he? I can't, I can't remember what happened in that movie. I was the one who was like set in the was it set in the desert. It was Sandy. I'm gonna cover an oil in that movie, didn't I? That was. Or something and he had to stop solace no no it was quantum yet. and they, they weren't spectre yet i remember that that was a that was a very memorable entry in uh the bond series 
Brooklyn Nine-Nine has been renewed for a seventh season. This comes at its new home of NBC. It was saved by NBC last year after Fox cancelled the show. And after premiering on NBC, it had the best ratings the show had received since season two premiere. I don't have anything funny to say here. If you want something funny, that's what Brooklyn Nine-Nine is for. And then we have our trailer trash. Massive week for trailers. We had, of course, the Dark Phoenix trailer, which we briefly mentioned a second ago. I've, I've been pretty critical of this movie <laughs> because it looks like a bit of a mess. And the release and the production of it look a mess as well. I don't even really remember the first trailer. It came out quite a long time ago. Um, there was a shot of Jean Grey crying in the rain, which now I'm thinking, was that also in this trailer? Or was it reshot? I don't know. Uh, look, I, I, as with all this stuff, I tried giving it an open mind, and I really did. And some of the effects, as far as design go, look really, really cheap. Especially when Jean Grey is using her phoenix powers. She has, like, these cracks in her face and yellow eyes. It's, like, so bad looking. It's like something on the CW. There is a positive, I do like the shot of Magneto having his helmet crushed and that like murderous look he gives out of the eye, that looks awesome. That That, that is a nice shot. <laughs> I also have to like a buff tan Professor X, like, McAvoy looks so odd, he's like, looks like Mr. Clean or something, it's pretty funny. One of the things I could not stop laughing at this trailer for was there's a scene where like Cyclops goes up to Professor X and he's something like, like he, that, that was his name, Ty Sheridan, he's really acting the shit out of that scene, you can tell. And McAvoy either doesn't care or just did it in one take and was like, that's all you're getting. Because <laughs> Cyclops is like, what do we do, Professor? And he, he cuts him off like after and just goes, I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's like a mother scolding a child. I don't know what to do. Their tones are like really contrasting. He just snaps it like out of nowhere. I couldn't stop laughing at that. It's probably the, old, it's, it's the most memorable about the trailer. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Jessica Chastain is in it. She's like an alien. I think she's an alien. It doesn't... She just had bleached hair in this. I didn't really remember it. And yeah, we don't really know what her plan is. She's influencing Jean Grey, I guess. Quicksilver was in this very briefly. He's going to die, I'd say. <laughs> he just looked like he's going to die. He's running at Jean Grey as he's Phoenix and he's running on low debris. That guy is dead, I'd say. There's, a, there's kind of too much in this trailer. We get way too more than we need to know. There's We see a divergence about who wants to kill Jean. He wants to save her, obviously. Some people are going to side with Magneto. Like every one of these films, we're meant to be shocked. It just seems really weird us to kind of hanging around with Magneto. Like after the last one, he like he was so destructive. This wasn't like in the early X Men films where it was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn everyone into mutants, and then he was completely failed. This didn't he like kill a load of Egyptians or something? Like he was just trying to commit mass genocide. <laughs> and he's like, oh, hello, old friend. Uh, yeah, I don't know about this at all. I don't know what's this movie at all. There's a lot of stuff that looks just like we've seen before already. Especially like X-Men 3. I can't believe <laughs> they gave her the same jacket as the Phoenix wears in X3. The Famke Jansen wears. Like, of all the things to bring back, why did you bring back the jacket? It's not a, it's not a bad jacket. I'm not going to go with the jacket, but can you not be at least a bit more original? We have also seen where they're being transported on a train. And then they're attacked. It looks kind of like that part where they attack, where Magneto attacks a convoy of trucks in X3. The soldiers also have MCU patches on their arm. <laughs> I get it. Like, cause the Marvel Cinematic Universe is taking the X-Men. That's the, that's the highlight of this trailer. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Except for that part. Sorry, I nearly forgot that part. Look, it just seems like this is one part we've seen before. One part. I don't care. It's like, what? This is a really weird time to do this. I don't get why you now decide to make Dark Phoenix again. We just got Jean Grey and Psychops in the last one, and the last one was mixed. Why not establish these characters a bit more before just going, hey, remember X Men 3 again? Here it goes. Especially a movie that just looks so similar. Why didn't they just look over the last X Men and say, right, let's do things differently? It's just so rushed. I feel like if they really wanted to do a last film in the X-Men series, they could have brought back some of the original cast and just gone all out. I really thought we were going to see more of the original cast after Day of the Future Past. Such a shame we didn't. Because it's now, it's done now. This is the end of the X-Men universe and it looks like it's gone out with a whimper instead of a bang. Unfortunately. Hellboy got a trailer this week as well. <laughs> I sound really pissed off after I X-Men trailer. I'm sorry. I just don't know what to do. <laughs> Oh, I might just start using that. Not in everyday life, I get weird looks. 
but on the podcast. Hellboy, trailer two. We got a lot more violence in this trailer, that's for sure. This is our red band trailer, which means it's R rated, so they're, they're allowed to show as well the content. A lot of people were won over by this, or at least more so than the first trailer, because the first trailer was divisive. I actually thought the first trailer was, wasn't too bad. I, I didn't hate it as much as everyone else did, obviously. It's weird, because. It's weird because we co- were, of course, promised a darker film, and I don't know if it's darker, it's just more violent. There's obviously more blood in the Del Toro movies and a bit of swearing. It looks faithful to the comics, a lot of the monsters that in the trailer we've we've seen from the books, which is nice. It's certainly interesting visually, there's a lot going on, it's very busy. I feel like, again, this is a trailer where we have too much in it, we, we see every pretty much every monster and we kind of get the whole film. But it looks good, you know, I don't think it's as... I, look, here's the problem with this movie, right? It People who love Hellboy, most of them love the Del Toro films. And that's a problem. And the other people, I don't think they know or care about Hellboy. So you really have to try to win people over with this who love the Del Toro movies. And I don't think the movie has done a great job at that yet. It just feels not that different. And we were promised a darker one. And it might be violent, but I don't think it's necessarily darker. In fact, it looks very goofy and corny. Which is, uh, I don't know, I really think that what we what happened here is they put out the first trailer. I think the first trailer is probably pretty accurate to what the movie is, to be honest. And then they put out this trailer right when people blow over. And the reason there's so much in this trailer is they took all this stuff that made it look like a different movie and put it together so people would be like, oh, this looks more accurate to what I want to see. But what you get in the trailer is all of that stuff that's going to be in. All the more violent, swearing, monstery stuff. That's all in that trailer. And the first trailer is probably more accurate to what this movie would be like. Then again, time will tell. It's not that far away. It comes out in the middle of April. I would say I don't think I like the look of Hellboy as much as I did, which is a shame because when they put out those like promotional pictures at the start, it was like, whoa, that looks badass. But his face looks really weird. I don't know what it is. It's just too wide. It looks like he's got a big kind of block head on him. I don't know about his delivery of mannerisms. I, I think he could be struggling with the makeup. David Harbour, he's a good actor, but I think he just sounds a little bit weird. And I don't think that look works for him. On the other hand, Ian McShane looks like a pretty inspired choice for Bruton Home. I love Ian McShane. I think he could carry that role very well. The movie doesn't look bad from a visual perspective. Lighting, cinematography looks pretty good. Effects aren't that bad. There is a weird shot in the trailer. I I, I don't get this. I, I, maybe I'm stupid. <laughs> it's a part where Hellboy shoots a guy in the head. And then it's just a close-up of his face that's zooming out. So I, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. I don't, I don't know what the saying. The camera zoomed through the hole in his head. Is he up close? I, I just, I don't get it. I, I find that it was a very weird shot. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. We get a shot of Hellboy riding a dragon and kind of King of Hell riding over the river sticks and all that. Which I think me and most of the rest of the world is predicted that's going to be like an edge of old, but just, uh, blah, blah. Let me try and re- repronounce her name. Because I can, de- I'm, I always butcher names, but I'm sure I can do a better job, job here. Mila Jovovich's Blood Queen. I think we can all suspect that that's her showing him a vision of this is what happens when you join me. Then we have the last joke line, which is something like, because you're because I'm a Capricorn and you're fucking nuts or something. And yeah, that's not a funny joke. <laughs> it's just not very good, is it? It's kind of a weird way to send people out. I think, as I said, this film is a lot lighter and more fun than people expected. And we'll see if that is a good thing or not. It's certainly not the dark movie that people feel they were promised. I am excited for it, but uh, it's hard to judge what we're actually going to get. Not long until we find out, and then the final trailer I want to talk about this week, Shazam. So, check the description of this video. Not this video, this podcast. Unless you're watching it on YouTube. I did a breakdown for the Shazam trailer, so most of my thoughts are going to be there, including some interesting Easter eggs about the seven deadly sins of man. Potential villain, I should say. I will say I like this trailer quite odd actually I, I, it's funny I, I, I spoke with this last week I was like where's the trailer and then this week they're like okay here you go good timing now here is the thing about this movie I don't understand entirely what is going on with the marketing I don't know why they're leaving it so late this was marketed as the final trailer and it is only the second trailer we're about a month out from release I, I, I wonder if we're doing a very strange job here maybe they're hoping word of mouth will carry it maybe they think it's not going to play well already so they're just Kind of hoping it'll do modestly. There was some box office projection, projections that were quite modest. But again, that, that can climb it quite far out yet. I've also heard rumours that the movie's quite good. 
so I don't understand entirely what's going on with this. I don't know why they're being a bit less keen on promoting it. Maybe they, I don't know. It's just an odd, just, I don't want to speculate, but it is very odd. There were some people saying that what it could have been is that they showed a Comic-Con trailer and much in the way a Suicide Squad. They were like, oh, well, the movie doesn't reflect this, so they have to go back and do reshoots, and that's why things are down to the wire. I don't know if that's true, though. I, I doubt it is, to be honest, because a lot of the same footage is used in this trailer and the last one. Yeah, it's a good trailer. I am excited for this movie. It's got a real kind of warmth and humour to it. And I think it's refreshing that we're getting a character like that. That just loves being a hero. And plays off some of the tropes. And some of the expectations we have a hero. I think Zachary Levi looks like he's having a lot of fun as well. And I think he looks like he's doing a good job. We'll see when it comes out. Again, this is another one that we don't long to wait. It's coming out in a month. So, there we go. Let's talk about the box office. I'll do the top six this week. I have Fighting With My Family coming in at sixth. 40% drop. Which isn't bad considering how small, how, li how little it made in the first place. It made 8 million, 40%. Now it's at 4.6. Which isn't too bad. No, again, this is a, a film that was smaller. I said it, I think it'll have legs. I think it'll continue to get snippets and a couple, a little bit of coin each week. So, how bad? It's hard, it's quite good. I haven't seen it myself yet. I was going to see it this week, but I just decided not to, because I wasn't feeling well. Green Book, of course, won Best Picture last week. So it went from 11th place to 5th. Making 4.7 million. It wasn't a massive weekend uh, outside of the top two this week. The Lego movie is hanging in there just about making 6 million. Again, Lego movie isn't doing great. I don't know. Obviously, Green Book as well, I should say, had a massive theatrical expansion because of the Oscars. Uh, they added 1,388 theatres, so people were like, hey, people are going to see this now. Give it some extra theatres. The Lego movie, as I said, this franchise is just, I think this franchise is really struggling. I wonder what's going to happen next with it. We shall see. Elite Battle Angel came in third, made seven million. Looks like it's more or less about to die off in America, so that's not great. Internationally, though, it's not doing too bad. Worldwide, it's now at three hundred fifty million, which isn't again an awful number. I don't think it's big enough though that this will be the start of a sequel uh, of a, a series. We shall see though. The last Medea movie. I talked a bit about Medea the week before. I. Because I was kind of like, does this movie, do these movies even get put out outside of America? And I, this is fascinating. I looked this up for a little bit. So, first of all, let me just say how it did actually. It made 27 million. Not bad. It's the four best opening for this franchise. I think there's like eight or nine of these movies now. So, I said these films do well domestically, and I didn't think they came out internationally. And I looked into it more, and it is fascinating the Americans they come out in because it's so weird. So, some of them have been released in America and then only in Middle Eastern countries. Egypt, Qatar, UAE, that kind of thing. One of the films, from what I can tell, was only released in one international market, that being Iceland. <laughs> I, I don't know why Iceland. I, I, I'm not sure if there's a big crossover there, but hey. Also, I don't know. I, like, I've never seen any of these films. Is there a big... I only know them from their infamy. Is there like a big long-running narrative? Or could you just release a random entry of it in Iceland and be like, here you go. I don't know, maybe it does well on DVD in some countries and they release it based on that. One of the only consistent markets it releases outside of America is South Africa. So I don't know what that says about South Africa. It's just a bit weird. I don't get, I don't know. This might be the last one and I think Tyler Perry made broke some record this week. I'm I'm I haven't lo I don't have it in front of me. I think he was like the highest grossing African American director domestically. Like he's he might have made over a billion or something. I don't know. I could be completely wrong there, so I better reel that in. How to Train Your Dragon topped the box office this week, and it's the second week. Um, how it's outpacing its predecessor at this point in time, which is quite good. It added fifty-two million internationally, including thirty-three point four million from China. Good. This film is doing well, and from all counts, it deserves it because I've heard good things, and I'm sure I'll see it eventually and think, hey, they were right. <laughs> Hack headline for this week. Where we come up with a headline, some of the box office that some crappy article will use. It's Tyler Perry's funeral as audiences choose drag on to just drag. Get it? Because Tyler Perry is in drag as media. That's high quality content, people. You should send me money for it. Weekly watch we have movies. Of course, the massive release coming out this week is Captain Marvel, which is out on the 8th of March, this Friday, International Women's Day. I need to probably review this on YouTube first. I'll try to put a video review out at the weekend. 
I'll talk about it on the podcast in depth next week. But if you want to get, you know, the jump and hear what I think of it first, YouTube is the place to be. And I put up a lot of other stuff on YouTube, including a trailer breakdown for Shazam. So I would say, if you're miss if you're not on the YouTube channel, you're really missing out. So check it. Then we have The Kid, which is the only other film releasing theatrically, I believe. And it's directed by Vincent D'Onofrio. It's a Western starring Ethan Hawke, Dane DeHaan, and Chris Pratt as a villain. It's got a trailer. I think it's, it's quite odd. We got the trailer at the end of February. And this tra- the movie's coming out, you know, next week. Not even next week, the end of this week. So I don't know what what's that about. Why, why are they just last minute rushing us? I don't know. It's about Billy the Kid and his encounter with Sheriff Pat Garrett. Billy the Kid being played by Dane DeHaan. Pat Garrett being played by Ethan Hawke. Heard, you know, could be pretty good. Who knows? TV. Lots of stuff on TV this week. First of all, we have The Story of God with Morgan Freeman. Returning for season 3 on National Geographic on the 5th. That's The Story of God with Morgan Freeman. I think that started off as Morgan Freeman and then I lost my way because I realised I have nothing to say on the show. <laughs> I think I just wanted to get a Morgan Freeman impression in there and that's why I put it in. No, I, I, I think this is there's a lot of stuff, stuff on this week so I want to highlight some of it. AP Bio Season 2 begins on NBC on Thursday the 7th. Superstore is also returning that night. I've heard both those shows are quite good but I haven't watched either of them so check them out. American Gods is returning for its long anticipated Season 2. This has been in production for a long time. Heard all sorts of issues with it. But, but we'll have our answer whether this is uh, as strong in the second season as it was in its first. Because people love that first season. It's coming back on Sunday, March 10th. HBO's docuseries about Adnan Saeed, the subject of a serial, that podcast. The case against Adnan Saeed debuts on Sunday as well. I think that's quite interesting. We're going to see. Because the serial was a massive, like was, was the biggest podcast in the world. And I think it kind of fell off a little bit. But I wonder if it was as accurate as people say because I think they're talking a lot to some of the women involved and they're trying to get another side of the story so yeah we should see how that works out Derry Girls will have returned for its second season on Channel 4 by the time this is out Derry Girls is a fantastic show I absolutely love that show definitely check it out then we have (laughs) oh my god I forgot I put this in the list okay so this is Spielberg you were asking about TV movies this is a TV movie okay listen to this right so this is airing on the Hallmark Hallmark Movies and Mysteries which is apparently a TV channel your guess is as good as mine and here is what it's called apparently it's the first TV film in a series of TV films Crossword Mysteries a puzzle to die for (laughs) okay so it's there's Lacey Chabert and here is our plot synopsis. A brilliant crossword puzzle editor finds her life turned upside down when she is pulled into a police investigation after several of the clues in her recent puzzles are linked to unsolved crimes. Proving her innocence means leaving the comfort of her sheltered world and working with a tough police detective. Puzzling through clues together in order to crack the case as the two are fish out of water in each other's worlds. <laughs> oh god. That sounds like the best bad thing I've ever seen. It sounds like murder she wrote, but they were like, oh, books are too complex. Let's make it a crossword code. Like a cro- like a guy doing a cross. Like, that must be pretty. Like, let's just delve into this for a sec. Bro. So, in other words, there's words in the crosswords that are presumably going to link to unsolved crimes. But instead of giving the detective just the answers to the crossword, she tags along. Because <laughs> I guess she's going to be so smart that she'll be able to use those skills to help him solve crimes. What's even funnier is like the actual crossword creator and editor for the New York Times, Will Shorts, is producing this and came up with the story, which is like, Will, come on, Will. Are you that much of a one-trick pony? They're just like, they got the crossword guy and they're like, hey, Will, what do you got? And he's like, how about something about crosswords? <laughs> it's, you know, it sounds dreadful. I, I try to look up footage of it. There's no real footage, very little. I might have to watch this and review it somehow. It sounds just woefully bad. <laughs> oh god then we have a Netflix uh, walk ride rodeo <laughs> still thinking of that crossword show sorry it's funny as well I was looking, I was, when I was typing crossword mysteries apparently there's a whole book series that's not related to this and it's like the titles for it are, are awful as well it's like oh two down <laughs> it's the second name of the book and all that oh I don't know no wonder the show was late so week. I was looking up Dick Dastardly and crossword puzzles Oh, what am I doing with my life? 
Anyway, on Netflix this week for the weekly watch, we have Walk, Ride, Rodeo. This is a true story. I I tried to look it up and I read the plot synopsis on Wikipedia and it spoiled the whole thing. But then again, it's, it's a true story, I guess. So, can't be annoyed about spoilers. But it tells the incredible true story of Amberly Snyder, a nationally ranked rodeo barrel racer who defies the odds after barely surviving a car accident that leaves her paralyzed from the waist down. Yeah, I guess how that for the men's. Do you read it? Like, yeah, do you really think they're going to make a movie if it was just like this woman was great and she got paralyzed at the end? <laughs> it sounds like what was that other one? Uh, Soul Surfer, where that woman got eaten by a shark or whatever, and then she was like, "I can swim." <laughs> that's the word. That's not that what happened in that movie. Uh, did she lose an arm and then she went surfing again, and people clapped for her? Uh, well, she didn't. Well, one hand clap. <laughs> oh, that was horrible. That was horrible. Yeah, this is a. Uh, is not my cup of tea. I'm sure some people would be into kind of the soppy true story element, but there you go. Afterlife, which is the new Ricky Gervais show, it follows Tony, who has a perfect life before his wife suddenly dies. After contemplating suicide, he then decides to live long enough to punish the world for his wife's death by literally saying and doing whatever he wants to. Although he thinks of it as sort of a superpower, the situation turns tricky when everyone around him starts trying to make him a better person again. I watched the trailer for this and it just kind of came off like Ricky Gervais pushing his ideas on you about life and his philosophies and yeah, it feels like I've seen this a lot already. It doesn't feel like anything we haven't seen from him before. More power to you like if you like it. I've liked some of Ricky Gervais' work but not really gone on some of his more recent stuff so might give it a watch. We'll see. I heard some positive reviews so that's one positive. It's been in the works for quite a while as well I think. Well, regardless... If we're not talking about Ricky Gervais, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about our feature this week, which is Watchmen, which just turned 10 years old either today or yesterday, <laughs> depending when this episode comes out. So for our 10th anniversary, I felt it was only appropriate that we talk a little bit about Watchmen because it was such a, an interesting film. And the thing about it is I could have written about Watchmen forever. I could have written a really, really long piece. And I'm sure I will come back to it because we have a TV series in the works and I find it a very interesting film to talk about. So this is the feature on Watchmen at 10. I'm sure we'll come back to Watchmen again, especially when the show comes out. But until then, let's celebrate Watchmen's 10th anniversary by discussing it a little bit. can't think of a film I've had a more difficult relationship with than Watchmen. It's such a milestone of a film for me personally. 10 years ago, I was in my mid-teens and while a lot of superhero films have begun to grow stale or uninteresting for me, here came Watchmen. It promised a darker, more mature take on the superhero that would deconstruct the genre and the fallacy of Cape Crusaders. I'd started hearing about this film the previous year, when the first picks came out, and I learned a little bit more about the movie and the graphic novel. I'd never actually read a comic book before at that point. I wanted to, but it seemed really difficult knowing where to start, and they were still a bit niche and expensive at that point. And what Watchmen being adapted became a lot easier and a lot cheaper to pick up a copy of it. And that's how I got my first comic book. So really I owe this film for turning me onto a medium that I love so much and finally giving me an entry point. Not that it's the most accessible first comic, it's long and at times tedious, especially as a first read, but it had a remarkable sense of depth and commentary about superheroes and comic books as a whole, something I appreciated more on subsequent readings. That wasn't the only way the film affected me, the release date of March 6th had been burned into my head as the date the film was released. I was so excited for this movie and afraid I'd miss it that I went to the cinema by myself on opening night. First time I'd ever went to the movies alone as well. So it's fair to say that on a personal level, Watchmen was pivotal to me as far as a development perspective, and then access into a world of more mature deconstruction and analysis of media, but really to the medium of comic books as a whole. I don't know if I was ever as hyped for a film again as I was for Watchmen. And when I first saw it, I loved it. Which is strange, because I feel like, looking back, I was maybe a bit too forgiving of the movie, as I couldn't bear the idea that something I'd been anticipating this much might not have been amazing. I, I really did like it though. In fact I think. The problem with fandom. In general. Is that people are. Predisposed to liking a film. And therefore. Think it's immune from criticism or flaws. It has become the mantra of almost every critically derided property. In the last few years. Which is that we made this movie for the fans. In my opinion. Snyder's later DC films. Are often put up on that pedestal. By fans unwilling to accept faults. And mining it for deeper meaning. As if to show it's got some grand purpose like it's got something to say because if you 
mind it for meaning and see allusions to other media and art. Therefore, it must be important. The truth is that Watchmen is a complex film. And I don't mean the story necessarily or the film itself, but I mean it raises many questions about how faithful an adaptation can be and whether certain properties can be adapted to different mediums. The graphic novel is so tied to its own medium because of how it explores and comments on comics as a whole. You see, the comic of Watchmen is really well thought out. The panel layout, the colour scheme, the lettering, all these are used in different ways to get the reader's attention and show us the character's mindset or allow us to be more integrated into that world. Watchmen for decades was thought to have been unfilmable and it's really easy to see why. It was a book that used superhero tropes to explore complex political and social themes. It put careful thought into the presentation of violence and its use of space. Sometimes it's the age you are when you first find a piece of work can affect your opinion on it. In simple cases people cling to childhood films with a sense of nostalgia or hold them in high regard because of the joy they got at a younger age. However if they watch many of those films as an adult they'd no doubt see it through more cynical eyes. I always look at a film like Donnie Darko which was a movie that so many teenagers loved and adored because it had a troubled teenager being depressed and isolated and guess how many teenagers felt that way at the time. That film also didn't dumb it down for them. It had intellect and in many ways like a movie that spoke to teenagers was too smart for kids and not applicable to adults. So what I'm saying is lots of people have retroactively looked at that film and found it lacking. Whereas with Watchmen I feel like I've had similar feelings. The film seemed mature and meaningful when I saw it at a younger age, but now I'm not really sure how I feel. I think that depth was a bit of an illusion, and I saw it when I was younger. You know, I believe that the film was very deep. Of course, perhaps it was maybe me projecting that, uh, seeing the writing, the graphic novel on the film, maybe just passing those qualities between each other because they were so similar, giving a sense of importance or meaning. In fact, maybe another factor of fans' enjoyment of this and many other people's alienation of it is how faithful it is. Watchmen is maybe the most faithful adaptation I can think of. As far as comic book films, the only one I can think of that even comes close to adapting the material that closely is Sin City. Snyder stated that he literally used the comic book panels as a storyboard for the movie. And it's pretty evident. Snyder's always been a visual filmmaker, and in paying homage and getting a visual style that relates to the source material, he nearly always delivers. And that's putting aside any story or character complaints. Zack adapts his books slavishly. And that is where we reach another issue with the film. It's been a long argued point that Watchmen would have been more suitable to a limited series. Because it's just too dense or too long to do justice. It's one of the many reasons people call it unfilmable. It deals with different time periods. It's not always told in a linear fashion. There is a story within a story that only relates tangentially. Among plenty of other tropes that make it tricky to work on or to keep it and keep it especially for feature film at a decent running time and to capture the same themes and scope of the story so what did Zack Snyder do when he adapted it well he filmed every, everything really like the problem he's had in a lot of his movies in my opinion is that he, he's never really good at cutting down his films a lot of his films have director cuts and while fans have often pointed to meddling studios or unfair treatment of a creative vision what it does point to is that Snyder needs a good editor and that he's a little bit excessive. He throws in everything in the kitchen sink. That's particularly a flaw in a film like Batman vs Superman in my opinion. That there's just too much and the film suffers for it. The film had an extra half hour that was cut. Make the film a lengthy three hours. Watchmen as a theatrical cut for example. Is two hours and 42 minutes long. And at times that drags. While it does a good job of honouring the source material. It feels that length. A film being long is fine. But if it doesn't have anything to say or doesn't really move the plot forward, it can be problematic and meandering. And while the book had moments of this, the world is better established in it. You get better insight into the characters and can appreciate the illustrated art. Most importantly is that books aren't often read in one sitting. The theatrical cut of Watchmen is long and quite exhausting and it's far from the only cut. There was a director's cut at 3 hours and 6 minutes or 20 minutes longer and that wasn't even the complete version. Snyder had also intended to adapt a story within a story, Tales of the Black Friday, in live action. It was in the script, but realising the cost of it, it was animated instead. And realising that Warners didn't want an additional story that only had partial relevance added to their film that was already nearly three hours long. It was in the 70s that it directed a DVD film. 26 minutes long. This was then added into the cut, along with some minor footage to make the ultimate cut. This created a 3 hour and 35 minute film. That included essentially the whole graphic novel. 
as if the theatrical cut wasn't long enough, right? Three hours, 35 minutes. I tried getting through that cut before, and I have to admit it was a tough sit. Film was labelled as unfilmable because of the vast amount of content that is difficult to condense. And while many tried to get around that issue in their adaptation, Snyder more or less ignored this and filmed everything. I'm not saying the film isn't an admirable attempt, but it faces the problem of putting Watchmen in film as opposed to television. It becomes long at times and sluggish. It's not a knock at the film, but it raises the question of what makes a good adaptation. Watchmen as a film is faithful to a flaw. In doing that, it ignores the difference between the mediums and doesn't fully adapt to what a Watchmen film should probably be. Which brings us to our next point, and that is about the director, Zack Snyder, too. Like I said, this is not a hit piece on Snyder. He's done work I like, he's done work I love. There's some great features, he's a good visual storyteller, and for the right project, he's able to fantastically frame and make his heroes epic. What he made with Watchmen is admirable. It has quite good qualities. Plenty of better directors tried to make this film, and he actually did, so props for that, I guess. His faithfulness to the visual side of the story and retaining so much of the graphic novel is also something to respect considering all the butchered adaptations we normally get. He actually clung pretty close to the comic from a visual and narrative standpoint. Hell, even to get an almost three hour R-rated film out is impressive, especially 10 years ago. So now that I've given him some respect and some praise, I can say this. He was the wrong person to adapt this movie. Snyder is something of a divisive figure, especially since the DCEU. In my opinion, though, he has always had a problem with trying to make things look cool. Why that's an issue is that Watchmen isn't a cool story. Even look at the costumes in the original graphic novel. They look a little silly. The colour palette of the book used an alternate colour scheme, but it was still really colourful as well. The book also places emphasis on the mundanity of superhero lives and how pathetic and sad heroes are, and even whether we need them at all. The film is actually interesting because... It's just so odd that something that appears so faithful actually misses the point of the graphic novel. With 300 he was also faithful, and that was a Frank Miller comic. And maybe some executives felt he could deliver an adaptation of another dark comic from a pivotal writer of adult graphic novels in the 80s, like Alan Moore's Watchmen. Then again, they are both in the same broad grouping, but are totally different. Moore is a lot more subtle, and Miller at times almost fetishizes sex and violence. Snyder's well suited to the bluntness of a Frank Miller, but not to the subtlety or nihilist philosophy of an Alan Moore. Snyder has always battled with the issue of maturity in his films as well. It seems like he feels that he needs to prove how complex and mature his movie is to prove it has value. In the case of BVS, that means throwing in lots of plotting that was unnecessary and overwrought, and allusions to deeper themes to show how intelligent it was. What is odd in that regard is that Snyder tries to embrace more adult concepts in Watchmen to prove that the film is more important and mature. Excessive blood and violence, for example. Sure, the comic had a bit of blood, but never went over the top, which is what made the end of the book so impactful when we see New York devoid of life, with at times blood being the only thing you see on the streets. And however, putting violence as people exploding into guts and explicit snapping of bones doesn't demonstrate maturity. It actually has the opposite effect. The violence and adult aspects of the whole thing are one of the funner aspects of playing with an RA film. But in Watchmen, it feels out of place. Then there's the way he treats the heroes in this. He clearly loves superheroes. Even his DC films, as divisive as they are, they have moments of sheer childlike joy or glamorizing of superheroes, at least visually. However, Alan Moore doesn't seem to share that love. Especially when you look at the world and alternate history he created because of them. Snyder makes them cool axe kickers. And in superhero films, that'd be appropriate, but in Watchmen, it's totally wrong. Characters are meant to be washed up former heroes, they are damaged and at times pathetic. Using the idea of a hero to get what they want, they are fundamentally flawed and not to be idolised. Something more seems pretty intent on. They're not meant to be cool. What is strange is that, since it sticks so closely to the graphic novel from a script point of view, that the message might not have been lost if it were not for Snyder's direction. The gratuitous slow motion, the prison break scene, the lightning and the rain. It's all so cool. There's a reason trailers for this film were so popular. Visually, the movie looks outstanding, but only because it sells out the meaning of the graphic novel for those cool-looking visuals that class with what the script was trying to tell us. We're told that Night Owl is meant to be the schlubby loser, but here he is snapping arms and leaping around and fighting like he's a badass. Rorschach is supposed to be a dark reminder of how damaged someone who tries to be a vigilante would be. We shouldn't believe he's cool, like a cool anti-hero. 
He just thinks he's insane and not someone we should cheer for. Instead, he gets superhero landings and running around in a lightning storm. If you want a really specific example of this, the comedian in the comic, he's a clear indication that superheroes are not real. At least the idea of a hero isn't real. He's a rapist. He actually murders people. He uses his dad as a vigilante to embrace his psychopathic tendencies. Snyder gives him a badass moment where he lights his cigar with a flamethrower. All in slow motion. And it gives the killing he's committing a sense of beauty. People often look at the lack of subtlety and general in this film. And that any humour or commentary from the original source was lost on film. And while there is truth to this, some of it would no doubt be difficult to adapt. And likely be lost regardless since the story was written over two decades ago. And there was little effort made to update or modernise it for the film. Meaning any social importance the original had is now gone, as it's speaking more to a time that has passed. While Snyder did argue that the film is a satire, although, how exactly? While we could argue that the fight choreography that was seen as lame at times in a statement on how bland these superhero films are, it doesn't really work, especially when his superhero films and a film like Sucker Punch have similar aesthetics and styles, which might disprove him pushing the idea that this film is a satire. Is it really his fault though? How can you adapt this film? It's something no one has ever really answered. As we said, Watchmen is so tied to the medium it was born in, is long and dense, and certainly it's still a masterpiece. Very much took the context of its time, though. It doesn't cheapen the book any bit, but it does simply raise the question of whether a perfect adaptation of Watchmen is or was ever possible. I'd wager not. Even though I see the faults of Snyder's adaptation, and why, in many ways, I still love it. While it does at time care too much about the visuals, are still breathtaking and cool even when that might be odd given what the book was trying to tell us. The casting for the most part is amazing, especially Rorschach and Night Owl, and I also quite like Dr. Manhattan. While there is changes made, the movie did manage to tell such a broad story and make it work. In fact, I think the ending that they made for the film might not be as good or hold up to scrutiny. I think it might be better than the original overall. It's a bit neater. Then there's the beautiful opening credits depicting a world changed by heroes that ultimately gives us this new layout of the world and we get a sense of how we ended up where we are and that's sort of characters we're dealing with it's a good way to set up the movie and get that sense of world building out of the way early yet i always wonder whether this is a film that works as well if you haven't read the source material but does that really matter like the point of an adaptation is to make the property its own the film doesn't really do that however if the point is to guide people towards the original which snyder has often said is the case it does do that really this film is supplementary to the book it allowed us to see some of the great artwork brought to life and some of the characters portrayed like they've been torn off the page. Seeing the scale of some of the scenes and the effects that brought Dr. Manhattan to life, it's nice. It's rewarding for a fan. While I do have some complex feelings about the movie, it seems like once you've read the book it's based on, it's hard not to get some enjoyment out of the film, simply seeing the unadaptable and the unfilmable brought to life so faithfully. And while Snyder has his flaws, I wonder who could have done a better job or how. He called this film a labour of love, and stated that he made it as the studio would make it anyway, and took issue with previous attempts to adapt them faithfully. At least as a fan there's a degree of gratitude, or at least something with adapting something with such reverence and love for the source material. It's a shame it's not better. Even a bit different to make it more suited to a film in the late 2000s. I think that's why I have some interest in this TV series, because we've already had Watchmen beat for beat, blow for blow, and for better or worse, let's have something different now. While we can argue whether Snyder understands the source material or whether this adaptation isn't fitting with the graphic novel, here's what I think. This is the closest we can get to an adaptation of Watchmen on film. Film is both meticulous and lazy. For one, it really does nothing to adapt the source to screen. It just does everything. The whole book is adapted, even Tales of the Black Friday. If you got to subsequent editions, and while that is admirable, and great attention to details paid so we get the most faithful adaptation visually, it is lazy and that it doesn't really change anything for a new medium. Watchmen worked in the medium of comic books and that was how it was intended. And that was made with that in mind and the film we get every aspect part over, the panels are used as storyboards. However, because of how the comic was conceived, as a commentary on comics and superheroes explored in that medium, it embraced and experimented with that form. Something which the film doesn't really do. The closest it comes to being a commentary on superhero cinema is nipples on Ozymandias, and that's more of a stupid joke than any in-depth statement. What I can never stop wondering is how this film impacted things off. There's a commercial and overall all critical disappointment, yet it has gotten some more critical adoration over time, and it's not undeserved. 
Let's be realistic. This is considered by most to be the best graphic novel of all time. So the standards are pretty high. No one thought we would ever get this movie. So that alone makes it a bit satisfying. The film's never diverted attention from its source either. In fact, it drove many people, including me, to the original. And it clearly has a lot of love and affection for that. So it's hard to kick the film too hard. Even though it does deserve a few lumps for some factors. Perhaps this film deserves another feather in its cap. Watchmen's writer Alan Moore, along with Frank Miller, is often heralded to bring more adult themes and situations to comic books as a whole. While there were a few dark adult superhero films, never on the scale of Watchmen before, and few that flaunted their superhero convention so proudly, and in an age where superhero films are a big thing, and we laud our rated adaptation for the right property, Watchmen did it long before them, and it deserves a pat on the back if nothing else for trying. You can't help but wonder how this film would have fared now, perhaps more so than ever now, wouldn't be a good time for a Watchmen adaptation. Or if nothing else, a time to reassess or rewatch Snyder. It's flawed, impressive, beautiful, misguided, glorious mess. Okay, that's our show this week. Next week, we'll have, of course, the news, trailers, and next week we're talking Captain Marvel. So if you see the film, you want to let me know your thoughts, reach out. Um, do you think I'm wrong about Watchmen? Reach out again. Here's how you can reach out. Hit me up on Twitter pop underscore cult underscore pod instagram pop cult pod all one word you can email pop cult pod at gmail.com or you can join the facebook group pop cult compound and aside from that wherever you're listening to this please like it give us a positive rating if you can and subscribe keep an eye on the youtube channel as well there should be some stuff going up over the week all right that's it i'll see you next tuesday <laughs>